Last night I met my father on the bridge across a dream. A half moon sailed among the stars and shone upon the stream. I had become a little child and ran to take his hand. He swung me high so I could see a way across the land. I spied a thread of silver that snaked from north to south, from a shadowed hollow in the hills down to the river mouth. And walking by his side, he led me through the kiss gate in the wall, up along the grassy path to where the water falls. And seated on a mossy stone, we looked out on the pool where swirling currents palmed the moon and cupped it like a jewel. And as we watched, a salmon broke the surface with its tail and sipped the moonbeams with its lips till every speckled scale upon its smooth and gleaming back glowed like woven mail then slipped beneath a rock to sleep and wait the rains to turn the quiet stillness of the pool into a raging churn then parting through the rapid race like ploughshares tear the earth he'd seek the peaty high ground and the shallows of his birth now as it was a dream we stepped and skipped across the flow, like skimming stones go spinning from the shoreline where they're thrown, then took the narrow path that ran due east along the banks where silver birch in serried ranks marched down to the river to dapple shade over slackwater pools where during the day long-legged pond skaters dart and play. And though many hours should have flown, for I'd walked this path at times on my own, Yet in the blink of an eye, we reached the pass where icicles hung like brittle glass, crowning the valley like winter kings, over crystal clear waters that trickled from springs among the crags and frozen ravines, the shattered stones and sphagnum greens that hid beneath the scree slope cloak, the source from all but the sure-footed goat. In scrambling the slope that wound ever higher, my father grew slender and tall as a spire. He'd become the young man in my old photograph that had made his son smile with his comical laugh. Gone were the cares above his brow, and his hands were strong and warm as he held me back at the water's edge where the frothing bubbles swarmed. And as we watched, the dawn unpicked a keyhole in the cloud and filled the valley to the brim that made him call out loud, If there's such a thing as luck in the world, then the luckiest men are we, to live our lives in this cradle of land between the hills and the sea. His call stirred the cotton grass on the bog, that waved their heads as if to nod, like wizened men with beards of snow, knowing the way that we would go. It pricked the twitching ears of hares that hear every leaf and stalk that stirs. The padding paws of a homebound fox threading its way between the rocks. The trotting sheep with their winter fleeces shedding their wool where the stone wall breaches. And lumbering cattle that poach the shallows to drink where martins and swooping swallows gape for moths and fetch the clay to line their barnyard nests in May. Ever southward the water ran on, past dipping damselflies and dabbling swans under stunted oaks and gnarly ash, where courting squirrels chased and dashed around the trunks with chattering advances, like maypole revellers in weaving dances. Beneath the bridge by the hawthorn tree, we paused to see what here might be. Stealthy as otters, we crouched in the reed. As an eel swam under the braided weed, it tickled the toes of a patient heron, where it stalked for sticklebacks on its errand to feed its fledglings in the nest that squabbled for morsels from its breast. As we forded the river by the drover's way, I saw his hair had thinned and greyed. His hands, though steady, showed sinew and bone. His gait was crooked and he rubbed his thigh. Yet laughter lines, like rays of light, streamed from his eyes that glistened bright. A dandelion clock marked the midday hour, with its seed head full still fast to the flower. But as the time we'd spent had flown, how much older he had grown. We left the shade of the oakwood bower and stepped into sunlit meadow flowers. A wagtail preened upon a stone, 
A toad plopped in and swam for home beneath its yellow iris flags. And above the sprouting sawtoothed sedges, a spider spun its gossamer threads that glistened with greens and blues and reds and netted the drops of fallen dew that it spanned, the branch of an ancient yew. Over and under the water flowed, delving deeper as it broadened and slowed. It cooled the feet of waltzing trees that swayed and lilted in the breeze, their twisting trunks entwined like lovers, each enwrapped in the arms of the other. It swirled beneath the high-crowned beeches, and under the roots where the alder reaches its filigree fingers to stroke the backs of sleeping sea trout, tucked under the banks, in grey-lined shoals between the boulders, lying tail to tail and shoulder to shoulder. Mottled mallard ducks with chicks in tow sifted the mud where the waterweed grows, and speckled trout with bulbous eyes lipped and leapt for dancing flies, then darted below to hide from the eyes of patient herons who stand in the guise of sticks stuck fast like pointed arrows, jutting skyward from the shallows, or like the twigs of an uprooted elm that winter floods have overwhelmed. It lodged its limbs among the stones where wind and sun have bleached its bones. If only we could see as a wood mouse sees, could lower our heads through the roots of the trees, then our hearts would leap at the beauty of the earth, whereas the splendour of the seasons in all of their worth reveal themselves in shades of colour, in greys of winter and greens of summer with lilac blues and buttercup dyes, the purple and pinks of June and July, September scarlet and October gold, the holly wreath of a year grown old. For the secrets of nature are there to be heard, in the humming of bees and the songs of the birds, in the rhythm of water that carries a trace in murmured verse of every place, from where it burbled high in the hills to the tidal pools where the current stills. By now my father was bent and grey and leaned on a hazel to steady his way. Pausing to sit and take a rest, he pointed his stick to where a nest of hungry herons perched in a stand of sturdy willows that stood on the land between a mill leet long grown dry and a track to a barn that stood nearby. We watched and were watched by a beady black eye with a spear-like bill and a raucous cry that pierced the air and rent the veil of the stillness that settles as daylight fails. The railway embankment was steep by the crossing and he leant on my arm for his steps were faltering. The river too had slowed in its reaches as it sluiced through the reeds and lapped on the beaches of shifting mud banks that bore the marks of swans and geese and prodding marks of redshank, dunlin and oyster catchers and of a family outing of red-breasted magansas. Now quicker the dream began to run as if it hurried with the sun that hid its face behind the shroud of evening mist and rolling cloud. For here the river passed the quay and flowed on down into the sea. Madam grass brushed our heels as we crossed the dunes to where whiskered seals hauled out onto the rocks on an ebbing tide and turned to watch as we passed them by. Then a piping plover on the pebbly spit rustled a lark who alarmed a pipit who ruffled the herring gulls out on the strand that cried of our coming across the sand that curled down the ear of a scallop shell that sent a ripple to tell the swell that rumoured to the rolling deep that sent a wave from Neptune's keep that loosed a rope on the far side quay and floated a boat to my father and me. Then all grew silent and stilled once more but the dream drew in like a closing door. Side by side we stood on the sand. Then he turned to me and took my hand. The half moon shone upon his hair white as cotton grass on the heathland where it seemed to me only hours ago we had watched the trickle from under the snow. His fingers were slender and the knuckles looked sore 
with the journey he'd made and the years he bore. I bowed and kissed him on the brow, where the skin was thin and pallid now, yet warmly shone the candlelight that from his eyes were burning bright. I steadied the gunwale as he stepped inside and held the rope where it was tied, but as he passed his stick to me, I noticed then that there were three. My father, me and another now was seated on the forward bow, He lifted kindly eyes and spoke in a voice as faint as wisps of smoke. He said, this boat can only carry two. It is not yet the time for you. And dipping the oars out over the side, they pushed away to the rising tide. And as they slipped out of my view, a silver salmon leapt out through the door that lay beyond the sea and closed the latch and turned the key. The next I knew, both boat and crew, the moonlit silver on the face of the river, had all but faded and passed from sight. My dream had vanished with the night. I lay for a while, quite still on my bed, the song of the river still there in my head. Sunlight streamed through a gap in the curtain. Then I heard a sound, though I couldn't be certain, from far and away and high in the sky, like a heron's cry when down it flies to the estuary gates to open them wide, freeing the stream from the mountainside, on out to the ocean deep and wide. But then again, who can tell whether the dream was all in my head or just maybe whether it flowed from the river instead. For if there is such a thing as luck in the world, then the luckiest man was I to have shared such times with a man like him by the river that flowed nearby.